Working at Silver Dollar City as a train conductor was awesome. So what was it like to be a conductor? Well, follow me as I kind of walk you through a day as one. Being a train conductor at Silver Dollar City was an awesome, amazing experience, and I had a blast doing it. Every day was unique, but there were also some kind of standard things that you would do every single day. So what was a day like as a conductor? Well, on a normal day, we would have two conductors. For a Saturday or others, we may have three. The three conductors were there to help the extra heavy crowds during the daytime, but most days we would actually be able to operate with two outside of a little bit of time in the afternoon. You would have one conductor who would be the opening prep conductor and the other one would come in a little bit later. The opening prep conductor would get there about an hour and a half or so before the park opened. Their job would basically be to get everything cleaned up and set up and ready to go. You'd clock in, get to work, including straightening up the break room to make sure it was ready. You would get your paperwork ready. There was paperwork for every single day. You always had a daily log sheet, which kept track of all your activities, anything noteworthy, if there was any problems or issues. It all went into the daily log sheet. And then there were other paperwork as well that you had to do and keep track of to keep your records straight. And then there was the cleaning to do. We had to get the gun and clean it every day. When I was there, for the most part, we had two... 20 gauge shotguns and we would rotate them out so we would clean the gun one day and then use the other gun and then the next day we would switch so we were always using a clean gun but it was the one from a couple days ago so there was kind of a day break for the gun so they didn't get overworked we would also make sure that there were bullets available which were basically small gunpowder charges and we had sleeves that we cleaned the guns were modified just a little bit so they couldn't be used with regular shotgun shells or bullets so we got the guns all oiled and swabbed and, and ready to go we would go through to the depot make sure everything was clean there the garbage barrels had been left outside from the day before so part of setting up was bringing the garbage barrels inside we also had air blowers and we would blow out the whole depot. Being in the woods, we would get leaves and dirt and dust and stuff overnight. So we would clean the depot, blow it out, blow off the uh, train platform, blow out the areas around the station, make sure that everything was cleaned and set up. We also tested the equipment, the entry gates and exit gates. We went through to make sure they were working. We tested the sound system to make sure it was ready to go. We got the radios. We had two walkie-talkies. One that would go on the train and one that we would carry with us and make sure that those were working and gave them a quick test. That would take, on average, about an hour or so. But it would give you just a little bit of time before the park opened to walk up to First Aid and pick up the AED, which is our CPR electronic device that we carried on the trains. The other thing, if you had been doing really well, if you had a little bit of time there, you could also stop at the employee cafeteria, which was right next door to first aid, and sneak in and get a little bit of quick breakfast with the rest of the guys. Most of our train crew had breakfast in the morning, so you could walk in, pick up your breakfast, and the other conductor and the robbers were oftentimes sitting there eating breakfast. So you sit down, have breakfast with them and a number of other employees, and then head on down uh, to the train and get ready to go. The other guys at that point would then come down and they would also clock in, typically about 30 minutes before the park opened, 15 minutes sometimes, depending upon what was going on. Around 15 till, or right close to park opening, you would then get a phone call from the engineers down at the train roundhouse. Hey, the engine's ready to go. We've got her backed up. We're bringing her up. We often would know that ahead of time because as part of backing up, you could hear the whistles that they were signaling with. They would bring the train up and you'd have one engineer on the front and one engineer on the back. Well, our conductor then would hop onto the back of the train. The other conductor that stayed at the station, we called him the off conductor. So we had an on conductor on the train and an off conductor off the train. The robbers would actually hop onto the train because we were going to drop them off. And then this was kind of our test run. We called it a maintenance run. And we would take the train out. Uh, we'd have an engineer and conductor on the back, the robber sitting inside the back car, and an engineer in the front. Now, part of our job, besides dropping off the robbers, was listening to the train feeling it, making sure that everything was working right. We were listening for odd noises, things that weren't quite working. We'd give the sound system a quick check to make sure it was working okay. The off conductor, his job is basically to make sure everything is clear, wave the train in safely. So while the train was out doing the maintenance run, at this point the park is opened 
and we almost always had a line outside the depot waiting for the train. Our first train did not leave until 30 minutes after the park opened. You know, why, why not? Why not open when the park opened? Well, because the guests actually had to have time to come down to the depot. If your first train ride was when the park opened, there's nobody there. <laughs> so the one conductor would go out, he would open up the gate into the depot, and he would begin to let the guests in. Normally, the first train or two, it wasn't a real big crowd, so he could open the gate, prop it open, and then he could step back around. And if we didn't have a full station, the off conductor would generally kind of work the crowd. He'd talk to the guests, he'd see how they were doing, he'd answer questions, he'd entertain. I actually learned a couple magic tricks to be able to do during that time. And so the conductor who wasn't on the train basically kind of maintained the depot and the station and make sure that everything was okay. If the train depot started to get full, he would head around towards the front and hang around the gate. We got to be really good gauges of how many people were in that station. And so if it started to get close to full, we would know to close the gate and have everybody else line up outside. And we kind of swing the line around to make sure it wasn't blocking the sidewalk. At least we should. <laughs> Not everybody did it. As the train comes in after finishing its maintenance run, we would pull up to the station. The off conductor would wave the train in, letting him know that everything was safe. We'd hop off double check with the engineers, make sure that we were safe, sign off our paperwork, grab the radio and call in and say, train number whatever our engine was for that day is ready to go. We made sure that the AED was on the train. We often had an American flag that we would also put onto the back of the train. Get ready to bring the passengers on board. The off conductor and the on conductor would now switch roles. The conductor who had been the off conductor waving the train in at this point now becomes the on conductor and the on conductor who has just stepped off of the train now becomes the off conductor the new on conductor grabs the shotgun makes sure that he's ready to go with ammunition and everything and then walks up to the front of the platform where everybody is waiting in the station the now off conductor then goes out the exit gate and walks around to the front of the depot to manage the front gate at this point the new on conductor with the shotgun does the loading spiel and gets everybody in the depot ready to go. And you memorize these loading spiels. Here it's been five years. Goodness, has it been that long already? And I can still do the whole loading spiel by memory. Y'all ready for a train ride? Well, before I let y'all on this train, we got two simple rules to cover with you. Number one, if you've got little ones with you whose feet don't touch the ground when they're sitting on the train, scoot them all the way into the middle away from the openings. We do not want to see how well they bounce. And number two, when you get on that train, you're going to see a bright orange cable over your head. That is the emergency pull cord. It does not make the train whistle go choo-choo. What it does do is it lets the engineer and conductor know that we have a medical emergency. They're going to stop that train out there in the woods. We're going to summon emergency help and we're going to sit there for a long time. So if you don't have a medical emergency and you pull that cord, we will arrange one for you, waving the shotgun around. And then typically we would close with something silly like, now I do need to know, do I have anybody here from the great state of Arkansas? <laughs> All right, let me go over those rules one more time for you. People ate that up. They don't do that anymore. It's really sad. <laughs> If we had a child that was excited to be there that day, we might let them give the all aboard, open up the gates, let everybody on, and once everybody kind of clears out, the conductor with the shotgun, the on conductor, actually walks up to the front of the train. The other conductor has been at the gate holding the crowd back. At this point, once everybody in the depot is out of the depot and on the train, he'll open the gate and he will lead the people that are waiting outside in a line into the depot. The other conductor then counts off how many empty seats there are, lets the conductor with the line know, that conductor points out where the empty seats are, closes the entry gates, and we get ready to go. The on conductor then steps back to the train, looks everything over, makes sure that everybody is on board the train, that we have nothing weird going on, signals the engineer, and steps onto the train. The conductor, once again with the train PA, again reminds everybody of the safety. Keep your hands and arms and feet inside the train at all times. Don't pull that cable unless it's a medical emergency. Looks over the people again, make sure that there's nobody standing, hanging outside the train, jumping off the train, and he'll flip a switch so he can talk to the engineer and let him know, we're clear, let's go. The other conductor, the off one, has actually walked up to the front of the engine at this point. There's a place near the engine where he can stand and look over the whole entire train 
and make sure that everything is good. So if he sees something, he can actually yell at the engineer real quick. So if you have somebody that as the engine is starting to pull out, starts to jump off the train, which we did have happen occasionally, he can yell at the engineer. Or if you see somebody decide that, oh, my kid outside needs to get on the train and somebody tries to hand him over the gate, Yes, we saw that too. Again, you could signal to the conductor and the engineer, stop the train before somebody gets hurt. The conductor in the back would be watching as well, and if he saw something, he'd again flip the switch to the engineer, stop the train, stop the train, stop the train, until the engineer had managed to get stopped. We also had an e-brake in the back too, so if something weird happened and the engineer wasn't able to do it, we could stop the train ourselves. We didn't want to do that because it created other issues, but... It was there just in case. At that point, you're doing the whole ride spiel all the way around for the guests. You're having fun. You do the robbery show. During the robbery show, in fact, there's a point where the conductor disappears. He's actually standing up at the front of the engine, watching the show, watching the people on the train. If there's something going on, he may be talking to the engineer because the engineer also has a radio. So if something happened in park, uh, we would get signals that way. And then the conductor knows so he can let the robbers know during the show. Once the show's done, conductor again hops back onto the train, makes sure that everybody is seated and nothing's happening, gives the engineer a signal we're all clear, and you head back into town. Meanwhile, back at the station, the off conductor is again watching the crowd coming into the depot, making sure that the station doesn't get too full. We know about how many people would fit in there. In fact, I got so good at knowing how many people fit in the station compared to how many went on the train. I could oftentimes get that depot where there would only be about 20 seats left on the train. It, it, pretty good. Once we saw the station start to fill up, we would walk around towards the front with the gate. And again, watching, interacting with people, asking questions, answering questions, playing around a little bit, and just having some fun. Once the depot started to get full, again, we'd close that gate. We would stand there until close to time for the train to come back. We could actually hear the whistles out at the show, so we could know when they were starting on the way back. Once they started on the way back, we knew that we had about five minutes or so to get from the front gate up around to where we're having to wave them in. So if the station's not full, but we can tell it's getting there, we'll go ahead and close that gate and leave it closed while we head up to wave the train in just to make sure it doesn't overflow and get ugly. Walk around, and there's a spot where you have to stand that when the train is coming into town, you can look around you, make sure that there's nobody coming in the exit gates, hopping over fences, or doing anything silly. It was rare, but in three years, I did see two times where people came over those gates while the train was coming in. Not through the gate, over the gate. <clears throat> and it was basically the engineer's way of seeing that it was safe. The conductor would give him a signal that he could see and let him know it was safe. And if he didn't get that signal, he stopped the engine. Once he knew it was safe, he'd proceed in, park the train, and the conductors would then switch jobs again. The end of the day was a little different. The last train of the day when it left, the off conductor would actually go and he would actually just lock the gate. They counted off the guests coming in to make sure they didn't overflow the train. So one thing that the off conductor would do is instead of bringing the line into the station, he would actually hold it at the gate. And the conductor who was on counting seats would let him know. So that way only the number of people would come through who could actually get on the train. It was not unusual during busier days to have people waiting that couldn't get on that last train because it was full. And you didn't want them in the station because then you had to get them out of the station. So you'd actually leave them outside, keeping the gate closed, only letting in just enough to actually fill the train, and then locking and saying, sorry folks, that's the last one, there's no more seats. You would try to warn people ahead of time, hey folks, our last train of the day is coming up, I can't guarantee you you're gonna have a seat, you're welcome to wait, but there's a good chance you're not gonna be on. And we, again, usually had a pretty good idea, so we could tell people, you're gonna be on, you're really iffy, you're almost surely not gonna be on. You can wait if you want, but you're probably not going to get on. <laughs> Once that last train left, that off conductor would then go back around to the station, wave to anybody who was still wondering about riding the train, sorry, it's closed. 
He would actually take the trash cans back out of the station and set them outside so they could be dumped later on. Grab a broom and dustpan, sweep the station up, get the trash out of it, make sure that it looked pretty nice, and he would begin preparing everything else to shut down. He'd turn off the sound system, he would turn off the fans in the station if they had been running at that point, and make sure that everything else was good. So when the train came back, he could let everybody off the train at the exit gates, they'd close the gates, and then it's just a matter of grabbing the paperwork, grabbing the AED, pulling the flag off of the train and putting it away, make sure everything else was shut down and ready to go. In the midst of this, they would also radio into operations, hey, we're done for the day, last train's done, we're shut down. So that way operations knew what was going on. Turn the radios off, set them up, lock the guns up, get them turned in and taken care of for the night, and make sure that everything was set up so that tomorrow it would be good to go. And then the conductors kind of split into two different jobs. One, his job was to take the AED and the paperwork back up to the front offices, get them turned in, and let them know that they were shut down. The other conductor had to take care of the train. At that point, the conductor would wave the train out before he took the AED and paperwork up. The other conductor would ride the train around, pick up the robbers, head to the roundhouse where they would get off the train, put it to bed for the night, and that's when they clock out. And that's the day as a conductor! Whew! Long days, there was a lot that happened, but it was a lot of fun as well. So do you have any questions? I leave anything out? Lots of background <laughs> information in there for you that I hope you found a lot of fun. Let me know what you think. I'd love to have your questions and answers and, and love to know anything that I missed in there. Have you done a similar job at another park? Share that with me as well. I want to thank you as well for subscribing, hitting that like button, and sharing the video also. Don't forget to check the description. A ton of information there for you. I also want to give a huge shout out to my YouTube members members and my patrons. Their financial support means the world to me and I couldn't do this without them. I also want to give a special shout out to my new patrons and members. My new patrons, Mike Fensterer, I hope I said that Mike, to Dolan Moles, and also to the Southerns for increasing their pledge. Thank you so much for joining me on Patreon there. Or for those who are new YouTube members, I have Rob Martin, former Disneyland cast member, Michael Polisena, and just got a neat package from him. Thank you so much for that. And also to Rick Darrat, who's been with me for a while. Thank you so much for all your support. If you want to know more about either one and the perks that come with it, be sure to check the description below. Thank you so incredibly much for watching, and God bless. Open up papers. My papers are sticking together. I can't see my guide. Okay. And something that really I wish everybody could kind of do. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, uh, uh. Or something like that. That was... Ding. <laughs> the conductor would start to head up to the other side after... Okay, that's the wrong order. Okay. That's that. If you'd like to know about my merchandise, contact information, fan pages, and more, be sure to check the description below. If you want to make sure you don't miss any of my videos, hit that button right there to subscribe. And if you want to see another one, well, I've got a great video for you right here. If you'd like to be like these wonderful people here too and support me financially on Patreon or YouTube, well, hit that little button right there. It'll even give you behind-the-scenes access and more perks. Thank you so incredibly much for watching, and God bless.